any any questions about uh, the film, um, the background? Rich, why don't you come over? All right. <laughs> Well, um, I'll just, I'll dive in. Go ahead, go ahead, Rich. It doesn't need to be a question, it can be a comment. Sure. Yeah. I remember when we were making the, making the film, you guys mentioned you had a part where um, David Call's character was cross-dressing, but you guys didn't include that? Was that something, there's just certain scenes you didn't include that you wanted to include that you wouldn't see? Well, that's a good question, and that would be more of a question for our editor, uh, yeah. Rob DeVore, is also our executive producer, and our director, um, Jager Gravening, and writer, was not able to be here today because of um, kind of family concerns and some health concerns, too. Um, but, uh, yeah, I... I I was privy to some of the editing, but as a producer, I'm not in that room all the time. I come in when they either get stuck or at the end of a certain point where they feel good about what's happening and I come in and sort of give notes. But, you know, as with any film, there's going to be a lot of material that just never makes it into the, into the movie. And actually, they delivered, uh, to me, the first cut of the film was about 87 minutes and the script was about... Um, 104 pages and usually it's about one page of script for every minute on the screen so it's pretty remarkable they turned in a really lean film so I don't ever remember seeing that in the editing room so that just yeah I don't think that was even in in question you know maybe it didn't play I don't know yeah um, given the non-linear structure of the film that it depends how, how delicately it's put together how early along in the process did that become integral to the storytelling well, the original script um, uh, did not have that structure that you saw in the film. Um, it was uh, it was more linear, except for the the shooting being at the beginning of the of the story. Um, I worked with Jager for a couple of years on developing the motion picture screenplay, and one of the things that we uh, decided early on was that it was very important to us to have the shooting occur in the beginning of the film and then rewind the film so that it was um, more about, you know, as I mentioned before, more about the lives of people than this build up towards this, this moment, which we wanted to avoid. And actually we got a lot of pressure from a New York testing audience, New York filmmakers, to flip that and change that structure. And uh, I remember walking through Brooklyn on the phone after coming out of this test screening and talking with Jager and Rob, the editor on the phone, and. We just all decided, no, we're not going to change that. We really think it's important for the shooting to be in the beginning, get it over with, and then get into the lives of, of everybody. Yeah. Well, Rich, go ahead. Uh, well, I'll uh, add to that issue. There was a great concern knowing how traumatizing this whole event was for the Seattle community. And so doing the, uh, the plot that way, uh, I kind of think about it like Titanic. All right, everybody knows that the boat goes down. So it's really not about the boat going down. It's not about the gory shooting, uh, the killing and all the rest of that. This, uh, there was a real intent that this should not be a snuff film. It shouldn't be uh, some kind of a sensational thing that there was a real effort from the very start that there should be sensitivity to the horrible tragedy that went on. And so there's multiple layers of that built into the way the film was made. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And, and um, Rich came on uh, to the film pretty early on. I sent a copy of the script through a mutual friend, actually our attorney on the film, Lance Rosen. And I think, Rich, you called me from vacation. I think you were on vacation when you read it. Yes. Well, actually, I, I called you while I was on vacation. Right. And then this uh, script uh, intruded on the vacation. <laughs> I was in Hawaii. I got it in digital form. And I was reading it and could not get up from where I was sitting. The sun said, I'm getting cold and frozen. I keep reading. I take it to dinner. I'm reading it. You hear about this thing where they say, oh, I got the script, I couldn't put it down. You know, I thought that was just a turn of phrase. I couldn't put it down. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then when Rich expressed to me, um, you know, his, uh, his feelings about it and how it's registering and knowing a little bit about um, his background, I want you to share, Rich, a little bit with your background. 
Um, I'm a forensic psychiatrist, so terrible, horrible tragedies. Uh, that's kind of my line of work, sadly. So I uh, get involved, you know, after the circus has gone down Main Street and there's, uh, you know, all the terrible circumstances. But um, for what it's worth, I've lived in Seattle since 1996. I had an office very close to uh, East Republican Street where this occurred. And I'm a child psychiatrist also. So the whole uh, event of the Capitol Massacre really uh, hit home. It was close to home for me in all manner of ways. In ways I didn't realize at the beginning, but I've only realized as time has gone on. So uh, there was a real connection. I'm a child psychiatrist. I didn't know one thing about raves. And so I read the um, script and I felt like this was the most immersive experience. So it wasn't only about the terrible massacre, but to understand the rave community, where they're coming from, all the rest of it, I just totally fell in love. And this you, is not a paid advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> other, uh, Comments, uh, thoughts. Um, you, 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 of course, were here uh, when, when this actually occurred. In yes. And, uh, given, your, given your background, um, do you feel like because it has become so much more prevalent lately, the uh, you know, phenomenon of mass shootings, does it feel different now from when, it, uh, from when this occurred? Uh, a the little bit. I, and it would be interesting to know from the audience. So, assuming that people were around and when this occurred in 2006, was there some difference for you all in 2006 to 2019? Dr. Coder, we have another, so we have some psychologists here. Dr. Coder, you've just been volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just the whole prevalence, the incidence, the occurrence of mass shootings. So since this occurred, there have been many, many and bigger and more horrible with more deaths, right? It's just gone on and on. Think about what happened in Vegas, the pulse uh, at the, the Marjorie Stoneham High School. Uh, the, the magnitude has gotten greater and greater, and there is, I am going to, answer your question. Oh, you beat me into it. <laughs> yeah. But there is this sense that nothing can be done, right? The, uh, the elementary school in uh, Connecticut, the uh, per pervasive sense that no matter how outrageous, how outlandish, how disgusting, uh, that there's nothing that, that, that we just have to kind of put up with this. So that's my sense of what's occurred between 2006 and the 13 years uh, that cause us now. I also kind of get the feeling that there's a little more linkage to grander problems that we have in, in the world and the link to terrorism and people are, is this a, an individual and, the, and, the, and seeing someone descend into the anger or the, the fear or, or the, the unhappiness versus the globe and how we connect it all. I'm struck by the guy with the, with the sword that stabbed everybody, and the link is to terrorism right away on the news. Yeah. Well, yeah. But, but are we really talking more about people who, this all aligns with this spike in suicide, and are we seeing people combining mass murder and suicide mm -hmm. as an effect? That is, I want to die, but I'm going to kill a bunch of people when I go. Sure, well, there's actually, it, it divides by age. So you have younger mass murderers, uh, 
often they're doing stuff at their high school. Uh, the younger ones under age 18, they don't end up killing themselves. Now, it's a good point because many of them will say, I intended to, but they don't do it. 18 and above, the large majority do end up killing themselves. So yes, these folks are going out in a blaze of glory. Uh, by and large, they feel you know very disappointed, uh, disconnected. They, they have no meaningful connection, really. There's been some disappointment. And then they want to uh, get all the attention. Sadly, they get an enormous amount of undeserved attention for doing these kinds of actions. And uh, clearly, uh, in this case, um, the, uh, the uh, murderer uh, basically just <clears throat> decides upon some group. There's no real rhyme or reason. He decides that this, is, this group is uh, somehow the cause of his misery, and uh, uh, he must do this. Well, and, and the, in the story, in the development process, we, um, we uh, took a lot of the detail, including um, the opening of the film was a letter that was written, and, and it's repeated uh, word for word in the film, um, from uh, the murderer. We don't use his name. Um, I don't speak his name. Um, and uh, he had uh, destroyed a public piece of art in Whitefish, Montana, where he was living, shot up um, this moose. And um, that letter was written verbatim that you heard uh, five years before he got to Seattle. And though this is not a, uh, a gun control film and we don't wade into the politics of gun control, obviously with the movie, um, it is about gun violence. And the facts of this case are that he was uh, charged with a felony. Um, at that point in time, his guns were taken by the police. Um, later, that um, charge was reduced to a misdemeanor, and part of that plea agreement was that he write the letter to the artist whose work that he destroyed. And as a result of that plea agreement, his uh, guns were returned to him or to his lawyer, and then his lawyer returned the guns to him, and those were the guns that were used in this shooting five years later. Um, we approached uh, his story, the murderer's piece of the narrative, um, with uh, a great uh, um, look at sort of detail, like some of the other voice of you here is indeed his suicide note, which was left to his brother. He had a um, identical twin brother. Um, that is uh, part of the story that we thought about covering, but we didn't want to uh, go down that, that road. We left that off the screen. But the point is that um, all of the survivors here, these characters are not one for one uh, identical uh, to either uh, victims or survivors. They're composites, they're pieces of the um, individuals that the writer knew and director. Um, so that was more of a, an assemblage of, um, of, their, of their characters. But um, one thing I'll say about the, the trauma, because we're all sort of digging around uh, this, this issue of trauma, and ultimately PTSD, which is what comes out from traumatic circumstance when not, um, when not treated adequately. Um, in the process of making this movie over years, this is one of the things that has really hit me very deeply is that I really feel like um, the majority of problems in the world are stemming from untreated trauma. Um, and that uh, in the film, we allude to this moment where um, the murderer's uh, friend had killed himself and his parents. And that, in fact, was, was true. And in a way, he was doing, I'm, I'm in drug and alcohol recovery and have been for a long time. And we have a saying in, in uh, recovery uh, called the geographic. It's when an alcoholer, alcoholic or addict moves to a new place expecting that to somehow like vanish their disease. You do a geographic. So you up and move somewhere and you think, okay, all my problems will be solved. Well. This murderer moved from Whitefish to Seattle, I think, I believe, with some of that idea that he could erase that feeling that he had and that that trauma was untreated in that community. And it went on to inform in some way um, this tragedy here. So um, this issue of trauma and of course of PTSD, and it's within this community also, in the making of the film, it was, um, uh, I you know, had to use all of my uh, uh, sensitivity and awareness to try and allow this community and the survivor community um, and the families of victims 
to try and um, uh, input. And Dr. Adler was a great uh, assistance with that because we did a screening for friends and family of survivors and victims before we did the public first public showing of the film. I wasn't there, but Dr. Adler was, uh, um, he ran that screening for, for, for those, those folks. Right, but you got me the $10,000. That's right, I did. <laughs> so you were there. <laughs> um, yes. Wildflower. Well, um, it's interesting because um, I uh, I can see in a very direct way. It's it's about um, a person who uh, is in the background and has a, a strong feeling and urge to be part of the foreground, but stays back for a reason. Um, sort of traditionally, you might think it's about you know. Uh, being meek or mild or maybe, you know, looking pretty or something to that effect. But to me, the image in my mind that I've always seen is, is actually um, what happens at the end of the film with her return to the crime scene. There's this wall, this impenetrable thing that's high and gray and dark and dense. And then out of that, something grows. And that's her return to the, uh, um, to the home. Yeah. Initially, I was not really enthusiastic about the title, um, but over the course of time, I really came to understand. And the important thing is that a wallflower wants to actually be involved, as opposed to uh, some other circuit. They really want to be part of the situation, but they're having difficulty, and. Uh, People in the public often think, oh, somebody snaps, right? Uh, no, this didn't happen because he snapped. And the ambivalence is plainly seen, right? He really says, I'd really like to speak to somebody, right? How about if we date? Uh, yes, I would uh, t return you home, right? That he wants a connection. He's just, he didn't really come. Uh, clearly deciding that he's going to shoot up the place and he's struggling with that and you, you you sense that and so it really is this struggle is like a struggle that uh, people who are described as wallflowers have he also says to the brother I love you and he says to uh, uh, the imaginary girl from his youth right at the end I love you so there is even in this guy who does this terrible thing he's has love and he is trying to somehow resist these murderous urges yeah but we we uh we made a decision together to take his name out from the script out from the project not mention it credit the actor or his murderer because it's it's complex issue there's a lot of i still just speaking here i have you know feelings of uh of uh of intense uh, uh, of anger relationship to this crime that happened, and um, in a, in a way, it's like um, the uh, something really interesting happened to me a week before. I've only shared this with uh, about five or six other people um, before the uh, world premiere. I was uh, in a little fender bender on Queen Anne, and at one of the uncontrolled intersections, and my car was unfortunately not drivable and the person who, who had hit me um, their car was um, they got a ticket and in the process of talking with uh, the person who hit me um, the policeman was standing there um, I related that I was a filmmaker and I was a week away from my world premiere and wow my car just got hit and the person who hit me was like oh I used to be in film marketing in Los Angeles and I'm like really and I'm like well why don't you come to the movie you know and so I invited her to the world premiere and when she left the scene the policeman asked me over to his squad car and said, I need to talk to you for a minute. I thought, okay, this is something related to the accident. And then he said to me, I was at the house that morning. And then he proceeded to tell me about, um, you know, the, uh, um, the event. And I won't go into, into detail, but one thing he did say that really stuck with me was that he said at, in the Seattle Police Department, they still talk about this case. And he said, the reason that they do is because at this stage of history in 2006, they were completely unprepared to deal with the outcome of this. And he said he literally was with um, one of the girls um, whose uh, boyfriend was at the hospital 
they got the word back from the hospital that he did not make it. And uh, she was, um, of course, you know, uh, apoplectic. And uh, he had no idea what to do and how to deal with it. All he knew was he needed her statement. And once she calmed down enough to actually get the information from her, he basically just turned to her and said, you're free to go. And he said, watching those kids walk off into Capitol Hill at 11 o'clock in the morning is something he'll never forget. Because, and, go ahead. And what was done in this instance is really a, a playbook of what not to do. Right. Everything that should have been done wasn't done and vice versa. And the, the pain of this event uh, a decade after it occurred is still extremely palpable. The, uh, the police department brought in an expert from Boston University. It was a team of three folks. Within a very short couple of months, they wrote a white paper and essentially the whole event was then finished and done and wallpaper over. And that was the healing. Uh, when we had the screening for the survivors, I had arranged for the victim support services to be there. They had a booth. Survivors of crimes are entitled to as much therapy for free as they would like for the rest of their life. But nobody there was informed of that. Mm -hmm. So we act that that was a service and a resource people were fully entitled to, but they simply were not told about that. So we had those folks there ready and willing to sign folks up to make appointments, etc. So a lot of services and resources actually are available, but there was this, I think, clumsy effort to just put everything under the rug. Yeah, and, and it's, uh, there is, you know, for, for the, uh, judging by the responses of the community here in the, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of social media realm, uh, to me there's a lot of, uh, there's unfinished business with the trauma of this here in Seattle. And uh, I've, I've witnessed that firsthand through uh, PTSD and been, been the, the object of it. And it's, um, it's something well, that, that's, you know, that's gotta be dealt with. What, is amazing to me you know there's things that you see on a uh, singular basis or you read about in books or it's th theoretical but to see the kind of rabid pushback of you ought not make a movie mm. no movie no way no how let's just keep things under a lid uh, that has been a very strong component and at times it got really heated um, as a po and th there was no belief, I think that crowd had no belief that a movie could be made that was sensitive, that would be healing, that would help. And uh, it's interesting for me, as I've seen the movie now 10, 12, 14, 15 times, mm -hmm. I was sitting here thinking, oh my God, I'm doing better with all this. You know what I mean? It really has been helpful uh, to me. So, um, but you encounter people for whom this is extremely raw and not surprisingly. So I do want to, uh, so oh, David? Yeah, one more. Um, I was just curious about what the reaction was to the screening of family, friends, and victims. Well, it was actually, we, we had um, built what I call Therapy Village. So there was a separate area, uh, uh, the floor above with screened off, uh, uh, areas and we had eight different mental health therapists uh, ready to help anybody who wanted such help. It was, uh, and you were there. No, no you were not there, there. sorry. Um, but it was extremely quiet, somber. Um, people, nobody made use of the uh, therapy village. So um, it really was uh, a lot less emotional or had a lot less expression of emotion than I had imagined. Yeah, so I just want to say I was one of the people that were from Spring and um, as a sister, and I can only speak from my perspective, but just talking about 
that there's some controversy with the film being out and some pushback and how he, he did have screenings ahead of time, again, only my perspective, but working in the independent film industry, sometimes you sign, sometimes you sign up for projects and you don't really know what they're about, sometimes you don't see a script, sometimes you just say yes to things, and with this project, I really appreciated the sensitivity and how people were kept in the know, this is one of the projects where I think everyone could have read the script if they wanted to. I was sent the script and I was just one of the many <laughs> set dressers. So it was really transparent of what the film was about, what the goal was, how to show it, at least from where I was sitting and I wasn't even there every day, as well as the fact, um, just mentioning that the murderer is credited as a murderer and doesn't have a name. I, I'm younger, so I wasn't, I didn't know about the event until I was working on this film, um, but I still to this day don't know his actual name from the events, so I don't think anyone on set actually talked about it in that sense, so I think that was another way of being sensitive to it, because I know we had people on set sometimes that were actually there yeah. in the events, so I just want to say that with all that controversy coming out, like I feel that the crew and everybody did a really good job of trying to be sensitive to that and aware, so I appreciate it. Well, it, it, it went, the sensitivity went really far. When I negotiated my contract with John and uh, Jager, I actually put in, I haven't heard of such a thing, but I put in that if I felt that the film was offensive, wasn't sensitive, or whatever, that they would have to take my name off and not mention any involvement, and they readily agreed to that. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that was very important too. I felt as if I wouldn't get involved in something that was, uh, you know, a gory film or, you know, some kind of uh, snuff film or anything of that nature. This was not meant to be that. And I think what's wonderful, it, at least in my opinion, is they achieved that. Yeah. Well, and one other thing too that I, again, working in, on smaller films, sometimes things are put the wayside when it comes to crew safety and things like that. I don't feel like that ever happened on this film, um, especially on the days where we were filming the shooting. There was uh, police officers there from Seattle PD, which I appreciated having there, and there was somebody there who knew how to handle the prop weapons and everything, where sometimes those safety meetings don't happen, even though they're supposed to, but it always did on this set, um, and I appreciated that well as somebody working on the crew and our safety making a film that has that type of violence in it. So, I'm yeah. so glad you're here. <laughs> uh, I wasn't there that day and it's really good to hear that. Yeah we really um, as, as a producer my number one you know uh, issue in the process of making the film is safety of the crew that's number one and uh, we for example went um, three block radius um, door to door, letting people know in the neighborhood, which is five blocks from here, that we were making this film, what the subject matter was about, when we were filming, so that we would not alarm them, because we're reenacting all this. And we have to be as close as possible to the reality, which includes all the noise, all the shouts, everything that happens in the film is going to reverberate out into the neighborhood. And so part of our responsibility is to educate people about what we're doing, and we did that. But I also want to say that there are members of the crew here, as you know now, and uh, as a producer, um, we're part of a film unit to create it. And they did such a spectacular job um, artistically and in terms of their, their efforts and their dedications on, on, a, on a song, because this is a SAG ultra low budget film. So please give them a round of applause. Great. And there's, uh, there's one more person I want to recognize before we take the last uh, couple of questions um, who we're going to sort of celebrate a little bit down at Fanographics at our uh, reception here at 6 p.m. Um, our uh, illustrator, um, Anya Davidson, has come from uh, Chicago, and uh, she did the uh, amazing character studies at the end of the film. And uh, it was really remarkable, because I don't know a lot about illustrated art. I'm more of a sort of concept and script word person. I'm not the visual person. That's other, that's the director and cinematographer's world, but um, Anya was able to see the film, I think one or two times, and then create these extraordinary images, character studies, of 
these people that appeared on the screen and came through Jagger and I's imagination and then illustrate them. And because that's part of Strobe Rainbow's arc as an illustrator, a budding illustrator in the film, it really connected things for us in a, in a spectacular way. So if you give her a little round of applause, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Any other uh, uh, questions or uh, comments? You can do one more and then I gotta get everybody out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Sorry. One more. One more? Uh, Jagger and I were talking about the idea of the film or are there actionable results you want to come out of the film? Is there an action you wish people to take or, or something you wish to accomplish specifically? Well, um, we are diverting funds from uh, the film into, as you saw probably at the end of the credits there, into uh, crisis management, et cetera. Two of the people working on the film, associate producers, uh, Randy and Tristana, were both survivors. And um, they are, as with uh, other uh, survivors um, associated with the, uh, the event, um, are in need of help. And I, I, this is, you know, we don't, I don't, as a filmmaker, I don't come to this process trying to give you answers. I hopefully, create something that allows questions to arise about what needs to be done. Um, and Dr. Adler, I know this is his Oh yeah, business. I got an agenda. So he has an agenda. <laughs> but the, what's interesting is that there really is the art crowd that was involved, and for the most part, as is appropriate, driving the bus. However, when I read the script, it occurred to me immediately that as opposed to all the nonsense you'll hear after shooting on CNN that's just blather that doesn't lead to anything I had the belief I still have the belief and the hope that when you see this movie and it kind of settles in over the next day or two that people will have a real understanding of how these events occur and that's where traction can occur as opposed to the nonsense that you'll see in media after Sandy Hook and what have you. Uh, to me, without being a documentary, this is real. This is real about a real event where these folks were coming from and it shows you that you didn't snap, right? And it wasn't this and the usual tropes, but you got a real idea of how these tragedies occur. This is not unlike, although it's, you know, here it's from Seattle, but the scenario was not a one-off. The dynamics are not a one-off. This is really a good way to understand what goes on. Yeah, and if, if I could wave my magic wand, I would just, you know, quadruple or 10X the victim's fund that Rich, you know, uh, described. It could happen. Yeah. Because Tell your friends. <laughs> it could happen. Thank you. Thank you.